This is a continuation of the previous message. Where do I, it's just little old me. Well, look at Hannah, insignificant in her own eyes. But because she was faithful in her own walk, she wouldn't take the curse of barrenness to be hers. That wasn't, that was alien. That wasn't a promise. That was a curse. So she wouldn't accept that. And she forbade that and resisted that and overcame that by faith. And then through all of that, she got to be the one privileged to have some little foreknowledge and full revelations of this coming Messiah. I mean, this is so long before it ever came about. What role are you going to play? You're going to play as big a role as you want to play. You're going to play as big a role as you have faith to play and as you are faithful to play. Faith equals faithfulness. Faithfulness equals faith. You won't have one without the other. You're going to play as big a role as your faith is large. However large your faith is, that's what type of role you're going to play. Because however large your faith is, that's how large your faithfulness will be in all areas. Hannah was faithful in all areas. But your faithfulness will be in all areas, particularly in this area of having a burden to pray that these things will be brought to pass. So why pray? Well, let's go back to Daniel again. We never read that. Daniel chapter 9, verse 2. He understood from the books a number of years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Next verse. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Say, I don't know what I should be praying about. Well, that's why you have the ability to speak and to pray in tongues. Amen. Romans eight twenty six. We know not what we should pray for as we all, but the Spirit himself maketh the intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit makes perfect intercession for the saints according to the will of God in verse 27. I don't know what I'm praying about. I have a, an unction. I have an anointing. I have a feeling that I should pray. Well, then pray. Pray in English and say, with tears, God, restore the church. God, restore all things. God, don't bypass me. God, let me be a part of what you're about to do. Amen. And then pray in tongues so the Holy Spirit can make perfect intercession. Jesus said in Luke chapter 21 and verse 36, it's only those who pray always, who don't faint, but who watch and pray always. Those and only those who become worthy to escape all these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Luke 21, 36. And what are those things? Well, Luke 21, 26, all those things which shall come upon the earth. And he gives, begins to give a list there in Luke 21, 26 of a lot of those things. All those things that shall come upon the earth. Where he said in verse 36, if you'll watch and pray always, then you'll be accounted worthy to escape these things and to stand before the Son of Man. Hannah was insignificant. I'm sure a lot of the prophets prophesying in some cave or some barren wilderness area felt they were insignificant. And yet God said through Isaiah in Isaiah 44, 26 that he will swiftly bring to pass the counsel of the word of his messengers or his servants. Because his servants are going to be speaking in line with his revealed will in Scripture. And he's going to bring about their word. He's going to bring to pass what they say. It's a terrible thought to think that you are responsible. I say terrible in the sense that it's dreadful. It, it creates fear and quaking and trembling in one that you are entrusted with this word to speak it and to pray about it so that God can bring it to pass. Amen. While we never read, I never turned over to Hebrews 12 to read all that, but the last verse, verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire. Hallelujah. It's a dreadful thing. It's a fearful thing to be entrusted with this word so that you can be speaking this word and say, here's what's going to be brought to pass. Let heaven... And hell and earth know it, that God's going to restore all things and nothing's going to stop his hand. That's right. That he's going to restore all things. Amen. And that I'm going to get in the flow of what God is doing by beginning to pray and intercede for this to be brought to pass. Amen. Daniel didn't take it for granted. He saw what had been written according to the books. He was diligent in his study of the word. He saw what was there. The revelation came through the scriptures. Here's what God said I've said. Here's what I'm going to do. It's going to be 70 years. They're going to be restored. 
Daniel was diligent in his study of the word. He saw it from the scriptures. And then he said, And I set my face unto the Lord God and began to pray. Pray what? God, do what you've said you're going to do. Well, why should we have to say, do what you have said you're going to do and God's going to do it anyway? Because he doesn't look at it that way. He forbids us to. He's not going to do it just in spite of what we do or don't do. He's going to do it because somebody is saying, Lord, do what you've said you're going to do. It's a holy place that we have before God. It's a holy commitment to involve ourselves in to get in the place where we start confessing the word of God, saying to the Lord, this is what you've said, so that God can bring it about. He loves to hear his own word back to him. He's heard so much of denominationalism and man's thoughts and prayers and ideas. And when, when he hears, now this is what you've said that you're going to do, that you're going to restore all things. He loves to hear that, that he's going to bring that about. Has that ever entered into your prayer life? Has that become yet a part of your prayer life? God, restore, bring about the restoration of all things as you've spoken by the mouth of all your holy prophets since the world began. Has that entered into your prayer life yet? Has that become a burden to you? If, if you are spiritually attuned, if you're not, I don't know what else to say, I don't know what could help you, but that's what this whole church has been geared toward. That's what the whole burden of the church has been. We keep staying, we occupy until he comes. God hasn't uh, given us the privilege or the calling to escape responsibilities in life so we can go off and pray 24 hours a day. But he said, pray while you're being responsible in your responsibilities. He hasn't given most people the privilege of escaping responsibilities in life so they can pray 24 hours a day. But he has challenged us that in your responsibilities, be responsible for the most important thing, which is what God is going to bring about and bring to pass. You don't have to go to a mountaintop alone to pray, although that'd be good on occasion to do that. Don't neglect that. But you don't have to go to a mountaintop alone to pray. You can take time to pray wherever you are. And say, Lord, you know, I'm just thinking today, here I am at work, and I'm looking at the sun or the stars, depending on when you're working, and I'm just thinking that things aren't always going to be like this. There's going to come a change. You're going to do something new. So God, bring this about. Bring this to pass now. You're working around the kitchen, working around the home. You won't be there forever either. Well, Lord, I'm occupying until you come, but there are greater things that you have in mind, greater things in store. This is all, all that I'm involved in, all of this. This is all simply a means to the end. Bring to pass what you said. You're going to restore all things. I mean, there aren't going to be any carnivorous animals, no poisonous serpents. There won't be any sin or evil around. The Bible says that there's going to be a people who live on an earth, as I just described to you. There have been many people who have lived and died and never had that opportunity, but there's going to be somebody who lives and who does not die and who has that opportunity to live on such an earth. Do you remember a long time ago when we were studying in this church, as a matter of fact, it was back in the beginning, in a series from Matthew 5 and 6 and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, but the, a lot of the introductory messages there concern characteristics of a disciple. Because that's how Jesus starts it off. He gives various things that will characterize a disciple. He starts off in Matthew 5 and verse 3 saying this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we gave a lot of teaching on that. And then he said in the next verse in Matthew 5 and verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. They shall be what? They shall be comforted. Isaiah's word in Isaiah chapter 40 was, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Simeon was waiting for the consolation, for the comfort of Israel. Blessed are they that mourn. We gave a study a long time ago. Well, what does it mean to mourn? I mean, some of the so-called Beatitudes almost sound like poor attitudes to have. They almost sound like contradictions. Blessed are the poor in spirit, because then you'll get the kingdom. I thought it was blessed are the rich. Blessed are they that mourn. I thought you're blessed if you're happy and don't have anything to cry about. 
Well, you don't cry over spilled milk, that's for sure. You grow up in discipleship. But you have such deep concerns about such important matters that they're worth mourning over. That they're worth mourning over. Like the state, the present state of the world, an open denial of God, an open apostasy and rebellion against Him. And God said, I made man upright. The nation of Israel, Paul said, oh, I uh, sorrow with a continual heaviness for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. He said, I have a great desire to God, and that is that all Israel might be saved. The first few verses of Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 10. Paul said he was continually sorrowful and heavy. Over what? He, said, he tells us over what? He tells us why. For my kinsmen's sake, according to the flesh, the nation of Israel. He was continually heavy and sorrowful over that. Blessed are they that mourn. I gave you in that message years ago what should constitute for a charismatic Christian various expressions of scriptural mourning. And I just mentioned some of them to you right there. But I think, you know, I said mourning over your own spiritual state, regardless, because it follows on the heels of Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. That regardless of how much you advance in your discipleship, you're always mourning that you know you're not perfect yet, and it grieves you that you say those things that you shouldn't say, that you have attitudes that you know are odious and abominable before God, and it makes you sick to your stomach when you think about it or someone reveals it to you. Blessed are they that mourn. Mourn what? Over your own sorry, sad spiritual state. Because we haven't arrived at perfection yet. And so you mourn that I, I was disobedient. I should not have been. It makes you sorry that you were disobedient. That you mourn once you're saved continually after things like that. That you mourn if you're non-charismatic. You mourn over your low level of spirituality. You don't have the power. You don't have the enablement to even live a victorious life until you get the baptism. And you mourn as it were until you receive power from on high. You mourn because of the world state. You mourn because of Israel's state. But I think the last thing that I said in that study many years ago was you mourn over the contemporary condition of the church. It's in a state of such lukewarmness. We are rich. We have many things. Yet they are blind and naked and they have nothing. Oh, we've got charismatic books and we've got evangelical seminars and we've got this great speaker and this seminary and this new work is starting over here. Sounds like the church of Laodicea. Oh, we have many things. We're not blind. We're rich. We're increased in goods. And Jesus said, well, my evaluation of the church that this Laodicea is you are blind and you're naked. You're vulnerable, in other words. You have nothing at all like you think that you have. Now, this is a, an Amos 3, 7 type thing. It takes a revelation of the Holy Spirit that you have revealed to you the pathetic spiritual condition of the contemporary church world out there. Why is that so important? Well, nothing else is going to be restored until the church is restored first of all. I mean, Israel is at the end. Israel isn't at the beginning of the end time restorations. Israel is toward the end. And the earth, we know that's not restored. That's going to go through a great cataclysm before it's restored during the millennium. And so something, someone has to be the first that's restored, or you can't have anybody down here believing God for full restoration. The church is going to be the first thing restored. Why is it important to have a revelation of that? If you don't have a revelation of that, you're not going to be a part of that, of the restoration of the church. If you don't have a revelation of that, you're not going to be mourning for it. Mourning? How many people, friends, have ever gotten this message of mourning over the state of the church? Of, let's speak from our own perspective of, of mourning over the, the lack of harmony and unity that we find even in our own groups. It's not the will of God. Of mourning over that. And, and as a result, God said, you're blessed if you're born, because if you mourn, he doesn't mean you're just a big crybaby, but you're like the prophets. You enter into God's experiences and God's feelings over the whole matter. And, and entering into that, you're praying, you're interceding on behalf of the church. And God said, you're going to be comforted. 
Well, the only thing that could be comforting to me is that whatever it is I'm praying about, I get an answer to it. Otherwise, it's not comforting to me. So in other words, if that's a part of blessed are they that mourn, you go ahead and interpret it however you want to. Obviously, he's not talking about blessed are people who just cry a lot. You must, you've got to have a biblical reason for mourning or it holds no weight for God. You won't, you won't earn anything for it. There are a lot of people who mourn a lot and God's not saying they're blessed at all. You might tell them that the joy of the Lord is your strength or rejoice in the Lord always. That's what I mentioned earlier, crying over spilled milk. That's not biblical mourning or weeping. Biblical mourning or weeping is mourning or weeping over the right things. Your state, your brother's state, your sister's state. Let's don't point fingers. Let's go back. Your state. <laughs> your brother or sister in general. The church out there. And God said it's going to be through that mourning which expresses intercession and deep commitment on our behalf that we're going to be comforted. That the church is going to receive consolation. That God's going to bring these things about. That he's going to bring these things to pass. So many times, if you get in the spirit on these things, you won't even know maybe exactly what it is you're praying for or about. But if I can say it this way, your prayers have eternal significance to them. God doesn't forget them. You may just kind of intercede a little bit and forget about it, but God doesn't forget. If it's the Holy Spirit praying through you, how can God forget what the Holy Spirit has interceded about? God can't forget that. That won't fall to the ground without being performed and fulfilled. God won't let any word drop to the ground. God's going to bring it about. God's going to bring it to pass. Maybe you ought to pull that tape out from years ago on Matthew 5, for blessed are they that mourn, they should be comforted. Because I poured my heart into that message because that had been my experience up until that time, and it's been my experience up until this time as well. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You say, oh, there's so many scriptures, there's so many things we're responsible for. That's true, friends. That's true. But Matthew 5, that's basic to Christianity. That's basic. That's elementary. That, that's what makes you a disciple or makes you not a disciple. That makes it or breaks it for you. If you're a disciple, you're poor in spirit, you mourn, you have a pure heart, you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you're a peacemaker, you're merciful, you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, you're persecuted for Jesus and his name's sake. That's basic to Christianity. Those are characteristics of disciples, you see. If you don't mourn, you see what, it's, what, I, what I'm implying there. That's basic to Christianity. That you mourn. That you mourn over the state of the church. That you mourn over the state of the world in open, filth, and rebellion against God. That you mourn over Israel and her little prideful self over there in Palestine now thinking that she's done everything by her own might and power. She's as blind as a bat to this day, spiritually. She's as blind as a mole, thinking that she did all that. God's the one who's brought her back. They don't even, they don't care in their testament, let alone believe it, that the Bible says in Luke 21, 24, that God's going to restore Jerusalem to his people. Well, they don't even read or believe in Luke 21, 24, and yet God did it anyway. Somebody's been believing for it. Somebody's seen that. Somebody's had the revelation and the burden. Or God wouldn't have brought it to pass as he has. God's going to bring to pass the restoration of all things. He's going to start with the church. Let me show you that over in uh, the book of Romans, chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. God's going to bring it about. God's going to bring this to pass. But he has a calendar. He's going to work things out in line with that. Romans 11, 25 and 26. The church comes first because Israel has temporarily been set aside. The great reversal in history has been Israel's hardness of heart for so many centuries. But Paul said that's temporary and God has a remedy for it, but that remedy will come in its own due and proper time and it won't come until it first is preceded with something that God's going to do in the church. Romans 11 and verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery lest you be wise in your own conceits that blindness or hardness, that blindness in part has happened unto Israel. That blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now, that is a church reference right there. The fullness of the Gentiles. Gentiles, we make that a church reference there. 
until the fullness, fullness means a full number, until the full number of the Gentiles be coming basically through the ministry of the church. So that implies that there is a valid, ordained, orthodox, authorized, apostolic church that's in existence so that the full number of the Gentiles can come into that. And he said, blindness in part has happened unto Israel until, now what's an until word mean? Except it's the word of logical order. Something's going to happen, but it's going to be preceded by something else. Blindness in part has happened unto Israel until. The blindness is going to be removed. Israel, in other words, is going to be restored and redeemed and saved. But not until, not until the full number of the Gentiles come in. Not until the church has experienced her restoration. If God said, I've set the gifts in the church and the gifts are going to be functioning, or you don't have a church. You don't have biblical Christianity. If God said, I put the five ministry offices in the church, you're going to have them there, or you don't have full biblical Christianity. If God said, now, read in the Bible, book of Acts, epistles, this is the church in action here. This is the church in living color. If you don't have that, then you don't have the full restoration of the church. You only have something partial. So we're looking for the first thing that comes, the restoration of the church. God said Israel will not be restored until the church, by implication, is restored, until the full number of the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Fullness is kind of an abstract number, you know, the fullness. So how can you have fullness coming in? You know, that it, coming in implies a personality. Well, well, Gentiles is that personality. Until the Gentiles be come in. Come into what? Come into saving knowledge of Christ. Come into the church. So fullness isn't just abstract fullness, but full number. Until a fixed number of the Gentiles be come in. And then look at verse 26. And so... In other words, then, or therefore, and so, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Isaiah said that in Isaiah 59 and David in Psalm 14. Jesus taught us, friends, in Matthew 9, he said, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Matthew 6 and verse 10. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is that, friends? What is that? What is the model prayer, the, the first and basic essence of the model prayer all about as far as petitions are concerned, but the restitution of all things? that God's will might be done on the earth as it was at one time in the Garden of Eden before the fall. That God's will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. It's presently not being done on the earth as it is in heaven. But Jesus said, pray that it will be. Did you see? He said, pray that it will be. Don't just say, well, God's predicted that it's going to come about. There's going to be a millennium and a new, ha new age and new heavens, new earth. So it's just going to happen. He didn't say that. He said, pray. After this matter, pray ye. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done. Amen. On this earth as it is in heaven. And if it's not going to be done in the church, it will be done anywhere else. Let it begin here in the church. Amen. That your will is done here on the earth in the church. Oh. As it's done in heaven. Jesus didn't say it's just going to happen whether you pray about it or not. He said, after this manner, therefore pray ye. After this manner, therefore pray ye. Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. On all the fullness that that implies, thy kingdom come. We've got to be living up to that because we are coming up to that time now when God is going to establish his kingdom. You, as it were, don't get your mind into this. You just say, here's what God has said. I don't understand how he's going to do it. I can't see how he's going to work it out. But Hannah was never called to figure out her prophecy on the Messiah. She just said it's going to happen. God's going to bring his king and he's going to bring his anointed, his Messiah. I don't see how in any detail God's going to bring all this about, how he's going to work this out and subdue that and rearrange this, but that he's going to do it is what we have to be concerned about. You can't manufacture up something on your own, but 
there'll, there'll be no anointing, nothing will even come to you if you haven't first of all been instructed correctly in this area and begun to meditate in this area so that you're an open vessel so that God can begin to impress you. Now intercede and pray for these things to come to pass. What things? All things. All things to come to pass. Oh, friends, we sometimes get so caught up in our own little affairs and, and our own little affairs are building blocks to bring about these things. But we get caught up in our little affairs. And, and we, we, we can't see the forest for the trees. We, we tend to mistake the shell for the kernel. We've got to see that all that we're involved in is a means to the end. God's going to bring all things to pass. You know, we can give other people's testimonies and illustrations from their lives, and that is appropriate and proper, but it only has so much force and power as compared to when you can speak from your own life and from your own experience. And so let me just do that for a moment. I remember whenever I first received this message, the total end time message many years ago, that along with that came this, this revelation that I'm giving you tonight, that I was just one part of it, but that was important. I was a part of it, not on the outside, but on the inside. But I was one part of a great plan that God had ordained before the foundation of the world that he was surely going to bring it to pass. It involved the restoration of the earth. It involved the restoration of Israel. But it first of all involved the restoration of the church. And so to be a part of that, I had to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues. The only disciples the New Testament knows anything about are spirit-filled ones. The only way for anybody, including yourself, to know you're spirit-filled is if you speak in tongues. And if they found somebody who didn't speak in tongues, which meant they weren't spirit-filled, read Acts 19. They corrected that. Have you received the Holy Spirit since your conversion? No, they said. All right, receive you the Holy Ghost. And they did. Hallelujah. So I've received. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Since you believed? Hallelujah. You've got to have the Holy Spirit. But then you've got to go on and not just have the Holy Spirit, but learn to walk in the Spirit. To be a part of what God's going to bring about. And I heard these things and I thought, here am I, living in nowhere, known by nobody. And yet, and there are probably many other people like myself around. And God's going to use all of us, God's going to bring all of us together, and God's going to do some great, tremendous thing in these last days. Amen. And I'm not on the outside, I'm on the inside. I'm going to be a part. I'm in the circle. I'm in the field, I'm not on the outside. Amen. I'm going to be a part of it because God's going to use me to bring some of this about. And I remember whenever I went away to college that I stayed a number of years down there that I was just, I was absorbed with this thought that God's going to do it. I just couldn't believe that I had been born when I was born and that I had the privilege of hearing this word when so many people didn't. It was just beyond my imagination why God ever would have chosen me or how I of all these other people in this state or this region would have heard this message and received it and stayed with it kept it. I, did, I, I abode in it as Jesus through John said we should do. Abide in the truth. Don't depart from it but stay in it. And when I went away to school I would get up early in the mornings. I would go out on the seventh floor balcony staircase in the dorm where I was. Early in the morning I remember times well it depends on what time of the year. Sometimes it would be light depending on if it was that time of the year. Sometimes it would be dark. Sleeting, snowing, cold, I'd have a bathrobe on and slippers. And I just went out there to pray, God, use me. Lord, I want to be a part. I was a figure completely unknown. Completely unknown. You think you're bad off. You're at least known. <laughs> By a lot of us around, I was completely unknown. Here I'm on a college campus with 10,000 pagans. Well, there are a few believers there. I found one and married it. But 10,000 pagans around. And see, you don't have to be somebody big or significant or important for God maybe to take you and make you into someone like that. You don't have to be big and important and significant. See, what I believe is that a lot of what I'm experiencing right now, a lot of the blessings that have come to me and come to this church and come to my ministry, 
those things are due to some of those times I spent out there praying about, I don't know what, just Lord use me, and then I would just start interceding in the Spirit. Did I ever dream? Was it ever really a possibility or conceivable for me? What are you laughing about? You know how to finish that sentence? Okay. That I would be here, that you'd be here, that we'd be together, that I'd be who I am? No way. Just, just an insignificant teenager. And yet I know that God is faithful, and if we'll do what he said, not a word of ours will he, will he let drop to the ground. Not a word will he let drop to the ground. God is faithful. He's not a man that he can lie. Whatever he said, he's going to bring it to pass. And he's going to bring it to pass when and if there are people who stay with it and keep reminding him, Lord, I know this is the 18th time I've reminded you, but I'm going to tell you again that you're not a liar, and here's what you said, so do it now, do it. God loves to hear that. That's not presumption. That's boldness. Scripture boldness. He invites us to come to the throne room boldly. I have meditated on that promise here recently, and it was just, I was thunderstruck with it. It's such a trite verse, come into the throne room boldly. Throne room, the throne of grace, boldly. That's God inviting us to come boldly. Say, God, you said it, now do it. Now do it. I'm not commanding anything. You're the one who said it. So you said it, now do it. Because God is faithful. He's going to bring it about. Oh, my. And I just, I, it's just beyond me. See how God could have, but he did. He worked through all of that to bring about what I have, calling me into the ministry and raising this work up and bringing this about before I ever knew, before a whole lot of you were ever saved. Oh, I don't want to get too mystical on you, but, but God doesn't do anything, but he, he already has something that's bringing it to pass in the first place. Probably some prayers of various people, myself included or not, was responsible for your being here, for your salvation. You think just God just saved you one day? Somebody's interceding. Somebody's praying, either in a specific way, a relative of yours, or... In a non-specific way, God, bring the ones that you are calling. Bring the sheep in. Bring the elect in. So, lo and behold, you get brought in two weeks later or something. And someone has been interceding for that. Someone has been praying for that. And so we make it more specific. We're talking about the fact that God is going to use a group of people. There are 144,000 in number. By the way, the chapter we're talking about in Romans 8 where we see that we don't know what we should pray for as we all, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with these inexpressible groanings. Well, that's the Romans 8 passage on the fact that God's going to manifest His sons. God's going to manifest His mature sons. God's going to use a group of people called the overcomers or the man-child to bring these things to pass, to bring it about. God's going to use them. God is going to use them, and yet right now, right now they're in preparation, either in a sitting position or a kneeling one. The sitting implies studying, and the kneeling implies praying. Or we could say a walking, that implies living it. You're either praying about it, learning about it, or walking it out, one or the other, or a combination of them. Those people are in those postures right now. They're in postures and places of preparation right now. And, the, and one of the greatest ways of preparation or the greatest areas is this area of preparation concerning prayer. A deep encouragement to prayer. Oh, let this... You, it takes a revelation of the Holy Spirit to get this down into your heart. To think things aren't always going to stay the way that they are. God's going to bring some great changes. I need to be thinking about that. I need to be praying for that. Even even in the responsibilities that he's placed upon me right now. And for the most part, he hasn't privileged all of us to escape those responsibilities and pray 24 hours a day, but in those responsibilities to not neglect or to not forget what it's all about, that they are means to an end. That God is going to bring about the restoration of all things. I mean, it's going to be so specific that the Biblical writers give us the details of the animals and what the climate and the earth will be like. And he talks about the fact that the overcomers, the saints, the man-child, those who endure all things and overcome all things will be like a governor or a mayor over various cities and they're going to rule over certain areas. 
It's all very graphic and very specific. It's not to be spiritualized. It's not to be tampered with. Don't take from or add to that book of prophecy, John tells us, or your name will be taken from the book of life or the plagues will be added to you. They're going to be rulers over cities. Jesus said, if you're faithful in this life, if you're faithful with the small things, and I'm going to make you faithful and rule over large things and many things. It's going to come about. It's going to come to pass. I don't know what you were doing in 1977, but I know what I was doing. My first year in school, I would take all the opportunity that I had to study and to pray. I didn't mix with people because I didn't know anybody to, any people worth mixing with. But to pray and to intercede and to regularly stand against the devil and say, now this is the way that it's going to be. And, you know, you might think, wow, who does he think he is telling the devil this is a, that's just the way you're going to, you're going to act as one of God's sons and daughters. You're going to recognize that you have authority over him. And you're going to say, this is the way that it's going to be, devil. Amen. You are defeated. You're under my feet. Our church, this church, the whole body of Christ, the man-child company is going to put you under our feet. Amen. And Jesus is going to return. He will return. I read in Hebrews 10 around verse 13 that Jesus is expecting, expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. Well, he's there at the right hand of the Father, but he's expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. How could I, friends, let me paint it maybe in a little more specific detail for you, and I don't mean anything by this except what I mean by it. I'm just saying what I'm saying. But as I started off this autobiographical part with here a moment ago, you could give someone else's testimony, that's all fine and well, but it's most eloquent and most accurate whenever it's your own because you've experienced it. I know what I was like. I know what type of burden that I had. I had a burden as a 16, 17-year-old that a lot of people don't have, that all of the overcomers must have to be an overcomer. You're going to have a burden for the end of the ages. You're going to have a burden that Jesus returned. I mean, the last thing John, Jesus said, I'm coming quickly, and John said, that's right. Surely. Why won't you come quickly, Lord? Please come quickly, Lord Jesus. Well, it was the last thing he's looking for. What? The restoration of all things. Jesus said, I'm coming back. You know, it's like someone departing on a long journey. I'll be back. And John said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. He was desiring the restitution, the restoration of all things. But as I started to say, how could I, friends, ever have conceived in those days, in those days where I was, how could I have ever conceived? How could I have ever conceived? Here am I receiving this word, this blessed anointed word through tapes from a church in northern Indiana, so privileged to sit under that ministry, so privileged to have those tapes, so privileged to hear that priceless word being brought forth. And I had other friends around who received it before I did and fell away. And yet you could hear by tape there were a whole lot of people who hadn't fallen away, hundreds of them, hearing and receiving that word firsthand because they're there. And here am I, just a no one, nowhere. But a college student, a freshman in college, and it continued the other years I was there until I could finally get out, praying out on a seventh floor, windy, snowy balcony. Lord Jesus. And you know which way I turned my eyes? There were three balconies, and they faced north, west, and south. And being in Mississippi, I obviously went to the one on the north side. So I could look north, because my heart was to the north and not in any other direction. I knew what was going on in northern Indiana. And it was not without purpose that I didn't go to the south or the west balcony, the front didn't have one. It faced the east. You didn't have one there but the north one. And I faced the north said, oh God, would that you had send a chariot and a band of angels to catch me up and carry me to northern Indiana. Get me out of here. But until then, then here's my prayer. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. I prayed those words and many like words and then in the spirit over and then who would ever have dreamed that I that I would be one of the ministers of one of the groups that is a part of this end time work. Well, you can name the ministers 
the leaders of these bodies, you can name them, the ones that you know, you can name them probably on one or two hands. And there are thousands of people who have heard and are hearing this word and this message. Thousands of them. And you can name the leaders that you know over the various groups on one or two hands. How could I have ever dreamed that I would be one of them? Well, of course, you, you can't dream of things like that. You just press in because you know this is my responsibility to press in. And who at college is going to be up at 6 o'clock in the morning on a snowy day and be outside crying over the state of the church? But I knew Jesus had said. You see, whenever I came, friends, and first taught you those messages in Matthew 5, I could teach you those things because I had lived them before. That wasn't a new revelation to me, blessed are they that mourn. Well, I've got to teach something in this church. So we're starting off. Well, let's start with what Jesus started with, the Sermon on the Mount. Let's see, blessed are they that mourn. I wonder what that means. I could say, here's what it means, blessed are they that mourn, because I have mourned many, many times. And if you're a true disciple and follower of this walk, that's the type of spirit you're going to have upon you. You've got such an anointing upon you. It's an anointing that is non-compromising. It will not compromise. One jot or tittle or one iota of anything will not compromise. Because it knows to compromise is to compromise the, the process of God restoring the fullness of all things. You cannot begin compromising. That goes back to man's ways. And God said, see that you refuse not my new way. I'm speaking to you now. And I'm going to bring all of that stuff to naught. It's an anointing that refuses to compromise. But it's an anointing that has a deep burden of mourning and concern in the heart. And because there is that burden there, then you're mourning. Because there's that burden, then you're mourning. Jeremiah. I'll give you one other good example as we conclude here. Jeremiah wrote a book called Blessed Are They That Mourn. Five chapters. Lamentations. Lamentations. Lament. Mourning. He said, oh my Eyes are a river of tears. My bed I've made to swim. Well, he said that in the book of Jeremiah, one of the earlier chapters, and that's what the theme of lamentations is all about. My eyes have become a river of tears. My eyes, Jeremiah. He's called what? The weeping prophet. And I've made my bed. I think the King James may say couch. I've made my couch to swim. Why, mourning so much over the fall of Israel, witnessing all that has gone wrong and happened in Israel. See, as a prophet, God's revealed him, revealed to him what he's going to do. He's brought it to pass. He's done it as past tense. He knows what God is going to do in the future. Jeremiah evidently doesn't live to see all that. Daniel does as a, at, at an old age, the very old man, but Jeremiah doesn't. And yet Jeremiah, the fulfillment of all of that, the fulfillment of the 70-year prophecy in Jeremiah 25, the fulfillment of that has been preceded by a prophet who wept and who mourned. I'm sure there are even deeper things here that I don't comprehend or understand how something about human emotions, I mean, God has made man the way that he is, and he's made man with certain emotions, and we have ability. You know, other creatures don't even have the ability to weep. They don't have the wherewithal. They call them tear ducts or glands. They don't have that. They can't cry. We can cry. We can actually cry. It expresses very deep and profound emotions in our innermost being when we cry. I mean, literal tears when they run down your eyes. Other things can't do that. Animals can't cry. Human beings can't. I'm sure there's something in that, that that's the way by which we can enter into what is so beyond us, the feelings in the heart of God himself. Because the prophets themselves said that God wept over Jerusalem. And we see that realized so pointedly and concretely when God comes in the flesh and he does that very thing. He weeps over the city of Jerusalem. He said, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee together as a hen gathers her chicks, but ye would not. Jesus actually and literally and really mourned and wept over the city of Jerusalem. The tomb of Lazarus, he wept. Do you think he was crying over Lazarus? He was going to raise him from the dead. That's not worth shedding tears over. 
he shed tears over the fact that the people were so blind in their conceptions. He was groaning in his spirit over their hardness of heart. He wasn't mourning over the death of Lazarus. He's going to resurrect him. That's nothing to cry over. He's mourning over the present state of the Jewish nation. He's mourning even over the blinders that are on the eyes of Mary and Martha. Do you believe that I'm going to resurrect? Well, I believe you're going to resurrect in the last day. Don't you understand, Martha? I am the resurrection and the life. Don't you understand? I am the res- resurrection. You believe he's going to be resurrected in the last day? That's a nice statement, and it's theologically correct to make. But you've misunderstood. I am the resurrection. If you just believe that now, you'll get the results of it now. You don't have to wait for some future age. You'll get it right now. Your brother will live again. Martha said, I know, in the last day. Jesus said, no, I mean now. He'll live again. Turn over to John chapter 11. I'm preaching from that. Let me show that to you. John chapter 11. Jesus said in verse 23, He'll rise again. Martha said, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And he corrects her understanding of that. Then we have verse 31. The Jews then which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goes to the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, now you see, he's already corrected Martha's misunderstanding. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews weeping, He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And then we have verse 35, so-called shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. What do you think? What do you mean? He was groaning in the spirit and he was troubled. What's he troubled about? What's he groaning about? The fact that after all of his life and all of his deeds and all of his works that Mary's not coming saying, I'm believing for the best and nothing but the best. Resurrection today. She's weeping just like the Jews are weeping and carrying on as they were accustomed to do in an oriental land like that, weeping and moaning and hollering and carrying on about someone dead. And the one who's right in their midst is the resurrection and the life. It's not a time to weep. It's a time to go to the resurrection and the life and say, now, manifest yourself to us. Manifest your glory to us. Manifest your power for us here. The one who was the resurrection of the life was there in the morning over what? Death. Death's an enemy. It's not good. It's bad. And so Jesus groaned in his spirit. H- have you ever, you know, shared something, ministered something to someone, and they kind of miss the point and just go, oh. They just, they're missing completely the point I'm trying to make. It causes you to moan or to groan in spirit. You're troubled. Anytime you've got the truth and you're trying to minister the truth to someone else and you're preaching your heart out or testifying or sharing your heart out to them and they say, oh, I see that we're supposed to receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay, well, I did back when I got saved. You go, oh, that's not what I'm talking about. When you've got the Holy Ghost, you'll know that you've got the Spirit. You won't have to look back in some baptismal certificate or something. You're missing what I'm talking about. When you've got the Spirit, you're going to have His power, His unction, His anointing, His works, His love, His fruit, His grace. You're going to have it there. You tell people something and they completely miss what you're trying to stress or say to them. Or have I experienced this as a minister, trying to preach and minister, and people just say, kind of receive it. Some just don't. They just come right out and coldly reject it. Some try to receive it. What is it I'm... And you just have to groan and you're troubled in spirit. And so often you end up doing what Jesus did. He wept. He's not weeping over Lazarus. That's completely missing the context of him weeping here. He's going to raise him from the dead. See, the Jews, look at verse 36. They also misunderstood. That's why John gives us that verse. Then said the Jews, Oh, behold how he loved him. Come on, he's not crying over the loss of some earthly friendship. He was the one who... Said, let the dead bury the dead. Go preach the kingdom. He's not mourning over the loss of some earthly friendship. John wants us to know that the Jews misinterpreted it. 
They saw Jesus wept, and so they said, See, he really loved him. It really wasn't so much that he loved him, Lazarus, he loved them, the Jewish nation. And they couldn't for the life of them see the truth of it all. They thought he was out to do them some evil. He said, I am a man, and I've done nothing but good for you. I've ever told you and taught you the truth. And I've done nothing wrong to you. And you go about to kill me and say that I have a demon. I think that's here in the same book over in chapter 8. Verse 40, Now ye seek to kill me a man that hath told you the truth. You seek to kill me a man that hath told you the truth. Rather than lynching, getting a mob together and lynching some of those false shepherds called thieves, called Pharisees and scribes, rather than, rather than lynching some of them, the liars, Children of the devil, as Jesus said in John 8, 44. They try to kill the one who's told them nothing but the truth. Causes one to weep or to mourn. Well, I, I do have one final theme here I'd like to address just briefly before concluding tonight. In Revelation chapter 12, we read that the devil, in the last day, the birth of the man-child, is going to enter into war with Michael, and his angels are going to fight, and Michael's angels with him. And Michael and his angels will prevail and overcome the devil, the dragon, and his angels, and he'll be cast out of heaven. And then a word will be given to the earth along this line, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, because the devil has come down having great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. Now we see all that from the perspective of Revelation 12 as being future. That hasn't happened yet. It won't happen until the birth of the man-child, until he's called up to God and to his throne. So that won't happen until we're gone. To the man-child, the overcoming company, until they're gone. But what I'd like to alert you to is this fact, that there are always things that begin to happen before these big final events take place. And if there is a tremendous attempt right now by Satan and by his forces to overcome the church. It has been all along, but the activity has been stepped up to overcome the church. Now let me give you a type of this, if we, if we can conclude with this. Go back to the cross, to the crucifixion. We know that the crucifixion, there is the devil's attempt to erase the work of God by killing Jesus. He tried to kill him as a child. He couldn't. He finally has him on the cross. That then is kind of paralleled by the Revelation 12 idea. The devil is actually cast down. This is when he actually is able to bring about all of his work and evil on the earth. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth. The devil has come down having great wrath, knowing that his time is short. And so that's paralleled by the cross. However, prior to the cross, and I don't mean by many, many years, I mean by a short period of time, prior to the cross, according to the words of Jesus, in things like, well, John 14 and verse 30, the prince of this world is coming. He's coming, and he has nothing in me. And in Luke 22 and verse 53, according to the words of Jesus, there's going to be activity, pre-activity, before the activity really begins. Jesus speaking to the people who came to arrest him in Luke 22 and verse 53 said this. He's not crucified yet. It's the eve of the crucifixion, but that's the next day. He said this, this is your hour and the powers of darkness. Luke 22, 53. This is your hour and the powers of darkness. You see what I'm saying? The powers of darkness, it wasn't quite yet their hour. Their hour was on the cross. But yet their hour has already begun. That last week culminated with the passion account, the sufferings before we get to the death. All of that sets into motion what the devil is ultimately and finally going to attempt to do, and that is to kill Jesus. But before that, Jesus said, the hour has already begun. This is your hour in the power of darkness. Before we get all this blessed teaching in John 14 to 16, and then his prayer in 17 that Jesus gave to the apostles, before we get all that, we're back to chapter 13. The devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. John 13, 2. This is your hour in the powers of darkness. See, we often use that passage, or it's often been referred to, the one in Revelation 12, that the devil has come down to the earth having 
great wrath because his time is short. Well, in the most technical sense, he's not come down yet. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. He's not cast out of heaven until the man child's caught up. So in the most technical sense, the devil's not come down to the earth in great wrath, knowing that his time is short. Uh, but he is here in great wrath, knowing that his time is short. You just have to take off the first part. He hasn't come down to the earth yet. Now, in the Revelation 12 sense, but he does know that his time is short. Why? Because there are various things that are leading up to what's going to happen in Revelation 12, and that is the birth of the man-child. The devil already is aware of that. He knows what's going to take place. He can see it. And although the man-child has not been born, there are various things that are taking place and have been taking place for a number of years that are leading up to the birth of the man-child. And during this whole period, while we are being prepared and God is working out things leading to the conclusion of the birth of the man-child, the devil's not on the earth, but he's here in wrath and he knows that his time is short. Before the cross, before the final actual crucifixion, Jesus could say, this is your hour and the powers of darkness. And what I'm saying to you now is that's exactly what we're going to be experiencing from here on out. We've had a great word that's been delivered to us by a messenger God sent. That messenger is no longer on the scene. That must also be somehow included in all of God's will and plan, his wisdom of how he's going to bring these things about. But that would have to almost be the fact that we have moved from one phase into another phase of it. The death of the first messenger who brought this message. That means that we're approaching the end very rapidly. We're not back in wherever we were, whether that was stage one in the process or stage 15 in the process. Whatever number you attach to it, we're not in that one anymore. We're beyond that. And we're not to Revelation 12 yet, but we're on our way there. We're somewhere in between. And the devil is going to do all that he can do to wreck the plan that God has established. So what is our responsibility? What is our calling? A deep commitment in prayer. Don't forget Daniel 9 and verse 3. Once he understood from the books, then he said, I knew what I had to do. I set my face to God to pray. Pray what? It should be obvious. You simply repeat what God has said in his word. You're praying that whatever God has said will come to pass will come to pass. And that includes, first of all, the full restoration of the church. How is he going to go about doing this with the various divisions that we have now, even in our own circles? Well, he might not give you specific details, or then again, he may. But you don't have to know that to pray effectually and earnestly and in faith. You say, God, you promised that the full number of the Gentiles are going to come in. You promised that th th this will not be an aborted child, that that the child will actually be born, the man-child will be born. And so I'm praying that you bring that to pass. You see, I know there's a lot of the other side. There, there, there may be people who are praying a lot for that and then not living it. you got to live it. In order for that prayer to be answered, for God to bring it to pass, you've got to be living like an overcomer. So there's the other side, but we're not concentrating on that. We do that all the time. But we have to get into the Word, learn the Word, cast out these old denominational doctrines and practices that are still leeching off of some people. That's the other side. But this side right now is that we've got to be earnest in our prayers. But God brings this to pass. But God brings this to pass. There's nothing that I can say that will impart this revelation to you. It has to come from the Holy Spirit. To have imparted to you a revelation of what God is going to do and a revelation of the commitment that you should have to pray and intercede for this. I could say that if you get the revelation, you've been tardy because this message on blessed are they that mourn was given years ago here. Blessed are they that mourn. And you don't hear a lot of people teaching the message on Matthew 5, 3 or on Matthew 5, 4, but those were two that we stress a lot. I can only stress them because that had been my experience. Whenever you are nothing and you're called out of that and you end up being a leader of a, over people, then... You have, you have witnessed blessed are the poor in spirit because you know what you were and where you came from. And you see what God has done in and through your life and you obviously can add two and two and have some spiritual sense to you and say, well, this is the way that it's going to be. Blessed are those that are poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. God's going to comfort them. 
because they're going to be mourning over the right thing, praying for the right thing, and, and the answer to their prayer, which is the restoration of all things, is going to give them a great comfort in their heart. Well, I wish we could have had church yesterday, because I think I was more anointed yesterday to teach this than I am today, because I was in it the whole day. Oh, Lord, this is what you're doing. Blessed are they that mourn. People are so busy in life, but blessed are they that mourn. I don't know about you, but I, I want to be a Simeon. I want to be Anna. I want to be Hannah. I want to be Paul. I have a continual heaviness and sorrow in my heart for the nation of Israel. I have a continual heaviness and sorrow in my heart for the church, the denominational church out there who served God through famines and wars and divisions of nations with very, very little light or truth on her side. Can you imagine the Lutherans and the Catholics who've been fighting for the faith for all these centuries and they hardly have any faith in their group to be fighting for? Yet they've endured famines and pestilences and everything, wars. Roman Catholics against the Protestants and the Protestants against the Roman Catholics fighting so much. I have a great heaviness in my heart for all those poor people who have fought so long, most of them to die and to go to hell. I have a burden for that whole system out there that the true sheep will be brought out of it. A burden for the charismatic people who got all of this truth with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and who have so much you don't know what to do with it all. So it's all dissipated in praise or speaking in tongues or evangelism or something. They're not making preparation and commitment right now in their own life so that God can use them in a greater way later on. I have a burden and a continual sorrow and heaviness in my heart for all of the little Schisms and divisions and unscriptural devices and mentalities that even the overcomers are manifesting. That God will purify all of that. That he'll make the church a pure church without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. A bride that, that truly is acceptable to Christ and that is presentable to him. A bride that's worthy of him.